Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. And today, as promised, we're going to have a look at Russian vids and his confusion about the star trails in the sky. So cue up the music and let's go. Well, the link to this video is in the description. So let's go ahead and get started and see what Russian vids has to say. As always, truth in music and movies, this is the world of duality, the world of opposites. And again, taking a look at this footage of the time lapse of the stars going around. That is, the, again, the wheel in the sky that keeps on turning. Now, how is this possible with the heliocentric model, with the supposed sun moving at a half a million miles an hour through space, while all the other so-called planets including Earth, of course, are going round and round again as this vortex goes through supposedly endless space. Give me a break. Well, he's off to a great start. Now, this is the typical flat Earth argument. I don't understand something. I can't be bothered to look into it. So therefore, I'm going to declare that it is false. Now, the only reason that Russian vids is confused about the fact that the stars don't seem to move very much in the night sky is that he cannot break this concept that somehow those stars are very nearby. Polaris, our North Star, is nearly 400 light years away. Each light year is about 6 trillion miles. How much would Polaris have to move before we would notice it here on the Earth? How much would we have to move before we would notice a change in Polaris? Does it occur over tens of thousands of years? Of course, but in our lifetime, Polaris will be in exactly the same location because it doesn't change for us. We haven't moved enough for it to change. But let's go on. Now, talking about this Earth we live in, forget the Northern Hemisphere, forget the Southern Hemisphere. All we have is the inner circle, in the outer rim or the outer circle and the antarctic ice wall that holds the oceans in and this is something that's not being made up that we can see with our own eyes with this footage from a helicopter view above antarctica the antarctic ice wall actually all that is is the edge of an ice sheet jetting out into the south ocean if you go around to other parts in Antarctica, there are places that the peninsula comes out and expose rock. I don't really see what his point is. And the key word is that you can literally sail all the way around Antarctica and look at it. The concept of an ice wall at the rim of a large flat disk is preposterous. Now, one thing that absolutely amazes me about flat earthers is they have no concept of mathematics. You could easily calculate the circumference of the ice wall based on the distance from the North Pole. It's approximately 12,000 miles radius from the North Pole to pi r. There you go. That's the circumference. Yet we can literally sail all the way around the continent of Antarctica at a fraction of that distance and get back to where we started. That alone should tell you that the world is not surrounded by an ice wall. But we'll let him continue on. And take a look at this footage off the coast of California. Look at the ocean from this vantage point. Okay, I'm going to stop him right there and just point out the trick of the camera. Let's get rid of me for a moment and bring a cursor over here. Now, you see this building right here? This building is a level building. Do you notice how it starts very low here and gets much higher here? He is literally looking down a rather steep hill and trying to pretend as if that's a level piece of ground. It's not. It's a decline. You can tell that from the buildings. You know, the bottom line is even a little effort put into analyzing a photograph can destroy any of these arguments. So let's go ahead and continue. If we lived on a ball, a spinning ball hurling through space, how do we get these this footage of this ocean, and you can see the horizon and the water level. If we live on a ball, that water should be going down. We should be looking down. It's rising up to eye level. Yet, as I just demonstrated, we are looking down. 
because we're looking down a hill. And you can clearly see that just by looking at the buildings around. This area out here that he's talking about, this isn't water out here. These are mountains. That's water there. Look at the pitch of that orange roof. Draw a straight line out. Notice that the horizon is below that straight line. How many times do we have to point this out to flat earthers? I mean, do you not learn? Now here's just one other little point that shows you you're looking down a hill. All of this pole is below your eye level. And again, you can forget the ridiculous notion of the northern, western, southern, eastern hemispheres. All nonsense. And of course, in the school textbooks, when you look at the, the ridiculous ball of earth, and they show the, obviously, the inner core, supposedly inner core. How would they know what it consists of when the largest drill only basically went down 7.6 miles? So how would they know this? Well, guys, I live on a lake and I like to go fishing. I have this thing called a fish finder in my boat. Now, the question becomes, is even though I can't see them, how do I know that these are fish underneath my boat? How do I know how far they are under the surface and above the bottom? It's because I understand the use of a fish finder and that instrument is calibrated to tell me that those are fish and identify them to me. Likewise, we can look at seismographs and learn a great deal about the interior of our planet. We know that the core is molten and it surrounds a solid iron core. This we can tell by our instruments. We don't have to drill a hole there and physically take a sample. This is another thing that separates people that understand reality and science from people in the flat earth. We understand the use of equipment and instrumentation. Likewise, when I fly an airplane in clouds, I have to be able to trust my instruments with my life because I don't know which way's up and down when I can't see outside of the airplane. This is what we do with instrumentation, and this is why you will never see an instrument-rated flat earth pilot. Again, just take a look at the, the size of these people compared to this ship. And take a look here as well, this footage. Again, the magnitude of this ship. And somehow, again, this weaker force called gravity being able to hold on. Now, take a look here. Somehow, this gra these grass seeds are able to defy gravity. You know, grass seeds can defy gravity while gravity can hold down this ship. Things don't add up. Things don't make sense. You know, the only thing that doesn't make sense to me, Russian, is your total lack of insight. Do you research these things before you actually make videos for YouTube, or do you just talk out of your distal GI tract? There's a thing called geotropism in plants. That's how the plant knows to send the root down and the shoot up. It senses gravity. You can test this for yourself. All you have to do is take some lima beans and put them on a wet sponge and put them in a dark cabinet. They don't rely on the direction of the sun or anything else. They will grow up and the roots will grow down. Now, if you do the same thing in a zero-G environment, such as the International Space Station, and they have done this, the shoots go in all different directions because there's no gravity affecting them. They don't know which way is up and down, and apparently, either do you. Now, taking a look at the flat Earth model here, and again, I said it many times, where we don't know the full dimensions of the flat Earth. This is basically a representation, and the point is, is again, when it comes to star trails, I have to set the foundation so people understand exactly what they'll be looking at with, again, the sun and the moon that circle above like a clock. When you look at the moon from the inner circle, like I said earlier, the inner circle, not the northern hemisphere, say, for example, from China or Russia, when you look at the moon, you're going to see it, its face on one side here. You see here that how the northern hemisphere moon looks like. Of course, we only see one face of the moon, and here's the southern. So it's very, again, easy to understand why we see the, the moon from different aspects of the inner circle and the outer circle and why they appear as they do. 
And of course, we see the sun and the moon in the sky often as the sun circles above. Say, for example, you're in California and say it's about two o'clock, three o'clock. On many occasions, you'll see the sun and the moon in the sky at the same time. Okay, let's kind of look at a couple of problems that I have with this. So according to Russian vids, the sun and the moon pass along this circle that is the difference between the inner circle and the outer circle. Now the inner circle is bordered by the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. That is where the path of the sun and the moon go between those two locations. Now here's a problem that you run into. First of all, if I'm down in Sydney, Australia, I should see not only an inverted image of the moon, I should see parts of the moon that you can't see from New York City. Second of all, the sun and the moon always pass over the earth north of Sydney, Australia. Yet in December, the sun rises in the southeast and it sets in the southwest. Here in Michigan in June, the sun is no further north than the Tropic of Cancer. I am some 20 degrees north of the Tropic of Cancer, yet the sun sets in the northwest. How can that ever happen if the sun is south of me? Can you answer that question, Russian vids? Because the rest of this is just window dressing. The sun and the moon in the sky at the same time, with obviously both of them above the horizon at the same time. What is the other side of the so-called ball earth getting as far as Moonlight or sunlight during these periods of time can happen. Why don't you go ahead and explain to me exactly why we can't see the sun and the moon above the horizon at the same time. For example, today, the moon didn't set in my location until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. How could that be? Can we see a full moon next to the sun, or is it opposite in the sky from the sun? Have you ever looked? Okay, that's just kind of laying the groundwork with Russian vids. In our next episode, we're going to talk about the star trails and Stellarium and his confusion as to why the stars move the way they do. In the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by and visiting with me. I really appreciate your support of this channel. Remember, we have memberships and a Patreon, and all the funds from that go towards the Telescope Fund. So stand by for part two of this episode. Take care, guys.